lovely music that you're listening to right now is a cover by John Mack, covering the song Marry Me by Train. Hello everyone! So, I'm finally back. Um, so, I promised that another recipe was coming very soon, a recipe video, and it took a long while. I think, what was it, maybe two weeks or so? Or oh, has, it, has it been that long? But yeah, uh, why has it been that long? Basically, uh, I fell sick right after I brought all the ingredients and was all pumped and ready to make the pavlova orchard. And, you know, everything was ready, I had the ingredients, I was about to do it, and usually if I get a cold, uh, since, you know, Sydney's weather has been a bit weird, it's been sort of like, summer's been delayed, not really arriving at all, and then it sort of comes suddenly hitting us for a really short amount of period of time, and it's suddenly sort of raining, storms, and then suddenly it's just really cold, like winter arrived really early. So, you know, it's really messed up. And for a while, in my holiday, I've been not really sleeping early, staying up really late, you know. When you're holiday, you just don't really want to go to bed really early. And so probably all of those sort of worked the way up to wearing down my immune system. And for a few days, I initially felt a bit weird around the throat, but it was not like the usual way that if I get a cold, it usually always starts with my throat, and I usually feel sort of itchy and stuff. But it wasn't like that, so... I kind of just went along with it and just ate ice creams and cold stuff and potato chips, fried stuff, you know, everything that could irritate my throat and I didn't really care because it didn't seem like anything serious. And after I brought the ingredients, happened to be right after that day, when, which was the last week of my holiday before my um, uni starts again for second semester, when it's going to obviously get really busy for me to make this video, that I got sick. And it just like exploded on me like and I just had really runny nose and that didn't help my throat and made it really really like coughing really badly and for the first time my throat wasn't actually that much of an issue I was just coughing so badly that I couldn't sleep and you know so on like no one feels good in, when you're sick so yeah I couldn't really leave the bed and it was just too hard to make a video of for baking something nice and you know if I bake it I needed to eat it as well or share it with someone and on one hand I didn't want someone to get sick from the food that I make and on the other hand I didn't want to eat something that was that sweet that was going to make it really bad for me with all the mucus and stuff sorry too much info I know but yeah so anyway after that after a while I got back and I got all the ingredients again because the previous ones were obviously off and I got ready to make this new recipe video. So this is my first video in response to someone who requested for a recipe. Uh, Marzia723, she is, uh, I think, uh, from Greece or somewhere. Uh, sh you wanted me to make a recipe that is of something that is traditional to me, either Taiwanese or Australia. And since Taiwanese desserts are actually quite tricky, in not to say like Australian desserts are much easier, but you know, making cakes and everything is actually more traditionally what people make. Whereas Taiwanese desserts can involve a lot more sort of different style techniques that I haven't really ever tried, maybe once or twice, most of them failed. <laughs> so I decided to, and since because I don't seem to know very much about Aussie traditional desserts, despite I am Aussie. I went and researched a bit and realized that, oh, pavlova is actually, seems to be an Aussie traditional dessert, and it seems to be relatively fun and easy to make. So this is something I decided to make. Pavlova. Pavlova. What is pavlova? Pavlova is basically, it's almost like a meringue kind of dessert, but it's like a cake, which is sort of white, creamy, pale in color. It's got a crispy sort of crust on the outside. But then when you cut into it on the inside, it's like marshmallows, sort of like soft center. And it just gives you a really nice texture and it's really sweet. So if you really like sweet stuff, this is definitely the dessert for you. And the typical way it's served here in Australia is that you whip up a soft, soft whipped cream and you just slather it on the top and then you top it with these fruits, usually tart fruits to balance out the sweetness. And it just gives you this fresh, and really nice um, texture and taste, I guess. 
And I remember eating those when I was really little, but I didn't know it was Aussie traditional desserts. So thank you, Mazia723, for inviting me to do this request and finding out something that I should have known a long time ago. As for why is this um, recipe that I made this time called Pavlova Orchard? Uh, Pavlo Pavlova Orchard is not really a real thing, it's just something I came up with. It's a sort of a little variation, a twist. Uh, what I wanted to do is a lot of cakes seem to have a really cool design where they make little wafer sticks or sponge fingers that they put around the cakes, such as tiramisu sometimes does that. Um, I think there's another cake that we made in uni just last week that used that as well, but I can't really remember. I think it's um, Gato Concord. I think that's the name. But anyway, um, so I thought, because when I looked at Pavlova, I thought, you know, Pavlova is just a bit simple in design and I like to spice it up a bit, play around with it and just make it a bit more inviting and more sort of like, give it a bit more wow factor, like, wow, look at this dessert, it looks so cool. Something like that. And I was just thinking around and that popped into mind. I thought maybe I could do something like that. And adding fruits in the middle, as they always do, Maybe giving a bit of sauce, that shine, those different variations of color. It just gave me the idea that it looks almost like, you know, a fruit sort of farm. So maybe like an orchard. And hence I came to the name of fruit, uh, of Pavlova Orchard. And I hope that would sort of, this twist would make it more interesting for you guys as well. Obviously you can make it in a traditional way. Usually it's just, you make the batter, slaver it, sort of like pour it onto the, uh, or scoop it onto the baking paper lined tray and then just sort of move it around and spread it into whatever shape you want make some patterns with the spatula or whatever and then you might want to just make an indent in the center like a little well just so that you know the whipped cream won't ooze out and stuff and then when, once it's baked you just put slather whipped cream on top and put fruits on top or put whipped cream and put some passion fruit pulp on top and you just serve it that way and it's a very common dessert here, it's so common that you can find it all over the place, sold in the supermarkets, even like Coles, Woolworths, and also find them in lots of bakeries. Uh, the thing that's interesting about this dessert though is, it's actually not, we're not sure that if it's actually from New Zealand or Australia, it's actually sort of still under debate, it's something that they're constantly debating about. Uh, so. Yeah, but it's so common that I think you can consider it some sort of Aussie dessert. Uh, but one thing for sure that we know is that this dessert was created in 1926. Uh, it was to on it was created by the chef to honor a Russian ballerina called Anna Pavlova that actually toured both countries in that time. So that's a set, that's a sure fact. But whether it's Aussie or not, I guess just can't be sure about it but yeah I adapted the recipe from various websites and one of them was uh, because I wanted to make sure it was really Aussie so I used an Aussie recipe and one of them came from the Women's Weekly in Australia so no I guess it really is considered Aussie here in Australia and pavlova is actually relatively simple if you think it just sounds a bit difficult but as you can see it's not very hard to prep once you have the batter and the batter is simple in itself as well it's basically a meringue and meringue is simply composed of sugar and egg whites and you know uh, it's very simple to make and what pavlova basically is is a meringue beat into the stage uh, the stif stiff peak stage where it's all all the sugar granules have dissolved properly and it's glossy and stuff and then you would fold in the corn flour or corn, also may be known as cornstarch and the white vinegar and that's pretty much the only difference as it, for a pavlova batter to a meringue batter so it's just one extra step involved and what these two ingredients actually do the white vinegar and the cornstarch slash corn flour what these two ingredients what I've heard apparently that they do is help give the crispy uh, crust and the soft marshmallow center of this dessert. So that's the reason for adding these two. 
and you know there are various ways to serve this dessert one typical one that I already mentioned is you know just serving it on the plate like a whole piled sort of cake thing and you can do it my way that's one variation you can even use like a star tip the nice star tip shape kind of piping tip and pipe little swirls or rosettes leaving holes in the center where you can put a little diced or slab of fruit on top and some whipped cream you know so you can serve them as bite-sized finger foods there's just very very many different variations for all the kind of desserts out there so you can keep that in mind and always play around with it and decide what exactly is best for whatever purpose you want to do um, now with egg whites well with um, meringues egg whites is something very important and there's a few things you definitely need to remember before you start when you're separating egg whites and egg yolks from an egg you want to do it whilst it's cold because they separate better when it's cold and uh, there are a few ways to bring it down to room temperature because you need to use uh, room temperature egg whites for them to reach their maximum volume of beating uh, they just don't beat as well when you use them cold now you might have uh, be used to using white granulated sugar in most of your recipes for cakes and stuff and you don't happen to have caster sugar but you want to make now you have everything except for that well caster sugar is basically what the US calls super fine sugar and that sort of explains it it is actually granulated white sugar but what is done is it's processed for you know grab a small amount 100 or 200 grams process it for about 30 to 60 seconds and it'll become a finer granule and that's what caster sugar is it's a finer granule of white granulated sugar so that is a way that you can get that sugar if you don't have any of anything other than white granulated sugar at home uh, and the reason for you doing that obviously a finer granule will dissolve better than thicker granules for a job like this that is a reason for using caster sugar okay so and just some quick indications for uh, things to look out for when you're baking them if you find that uh, your pavlova seems to have little sort of sugar syrupy droplets forming on the surface it means that you might have overbaked your pavlova already uh, that to me, this was the first time I've made pavlova and it wasn't a problem because it's cooked under a slow oven so as long as you keep watch of it, it's very easy to keep it uh, to prevent it from over baking uh, to know if you've undercooked your pavlova basically it would have liquid oozing out from the pavlova if it's underbaked if you look for the right signs for it to be dry for it to be dry to the touch as well and sort of crispy as you when you tap it and stuff and uh, be pale sort of cream in color these are indications that almost sort of not just indicate but like guarantee that it's definitely ready and plus for pavlova uh, you are going to leave it in the oven to cool down with the door sort of left slightly open what we call leaving it ajar so you know leaving it to cool down completely in the oven is also going to give it a bit more time to cook as well but as a general rule for meringue desserts and pavlova, since they're so similar anyway, these kind of desserts you always want to cook at a temperature around 100 degrees Celsius or so. Something very low, what we call slow oven, which is low temperature. And over a very long time so that it has time to cook slowly. And that will sort of keep the soft, soft sort of marshmallowy center and the crispy outside. And it will just prevent all the other problems and finally we're doing this procedure in two steps obviously the f we need to do the outer fence for which is the pavlova sticks to make the fence of the pavlova cake and then we also need to make the pavlova cake itself but since we obviously unless you're super super rich and crazy you have like what five ovens since I only have one oven, we need to divide it into two sectors. You can do this on two separate days, or you could just, if you have an entire day to, to spend, then you can do it on the same day. But do it one at a time, you know, make the batter, pipe it, bake it, let it sit in the oven until it's cool, prepare the ingredients or something, and let it come to room temperature for the second batch, which is used to make the actual cake. Take that out store it and then you can begin to make the second part okay i rambled on enough 
So, let's get cooking. Rinse the eggs under running water and rub them with your fingers to clean them. First, let's separate the egg whites and yolks. You have to do this whilst the eggs are still cold. You can do this by tapping anywhere along the middle of the egg on the bowl to form a crack big enough for your fingers to split it open into two. Then, simply over a bowl, let the egg whites drop as you pass the egg yolk from one cup to another. However, if you really struggle with this method and you're probably leaving egg shells or breaking the egg yolk, what you can do is gently let all the content of the egg fall into one bowl. Then, using your hands, and scoop out the egg yolk carefully and let all the egg whites drop out from between your fingers. Now place glad wrap over the surface of the egg whites and up the inner sides of the bowl to prevent drying and formation of a film over the surface. Let the egg whites sit for 30 minutes or more to come to room temperature. Do the same with the yolks and store in a fridge for other uses. If you are in a rush to make this recipe and want the egg whites to be ready as soon as possible, Simply grab a larger bowl full of hot water, not boiling, because you don't want to cook the egg whites. And with the glad wrap still on, place the egg whites over into the bowl of hot water. This will condition basically the adjustment of the heat of a certain ingredient. This will condition the egg whites so that they will come down to room temperature faster. In order to test for the temperature, you can remove the glad wrap after a few minutes Making sure that your fingers are clean, you can dip your finger into the egg whites. If it feels neutral, then you are ready to use them. If it is slightly warm, that is okay too. If it feels cold, then you need a few more minutes or maybe you need to add more hot water, as the water may have gone cold. Once ready, set aside with the other ingredients. Preheat oven to very slow, which basically means low temperature, 100 to 120 degrees Celsius, or 212 to 248 Fahrenheit. The temperature varies depending on the strength of your oven. Since my oven is a bit strong, so I will be setting it to 100 degrees Celsius. Place the rack in the center of oven. Wrap baking paper around the outside of a 12 centimeter diameter by five centimeter height cake pan. Now remove however much baking paper you need to go around it. A loose base or normal cake pan is best for our purpose. Using ruler, measure the height of the cake pan and add 2 cm to the result. Mark it out with a marker on the previous sheet of baking paper you just removed. Cut off the excess baking paper. You should end up with a long strip that just wraps around the side of the pan and is 2 cm higher than a brim. Measure and cut another strip about half the length of the first one. Finally, line a large baking tray with baking paper and then lay the first strip on top of top half and then lay the strips on the tray leaving enough space between each of them and then using a thin marker mark the outline of each strip on the sheet of baking paper you want to use a marker because a pen doesn't really show very well flip the sheet with the mark side down on the baking tray so that we don't print onto our pavlova this will be used as a guide for piping our pavlova sticks so we will have enough to make a fence around our pavlova cake. Set the strips aside because we can use them again for making the pavlova cake. Here are ingredients. You have 2 egg whites, 110 grams of caster sugar, also known as superfine sugar in the US. This is basically a finer version of granulated white sugar and you can make this by processing some granulated white sugar for 30 to 60 seconds until fine. Then you have half tablespoon corn flour, also known as cornstarch, half teaspoon white vinegar, quarter teaspoon vanilla extract. Try to use the pure because pure ones taste better. Now let's make the pavlova sticks. Egg whites need to be in a bowl without any grease or foreign matter to reach its full volume and also need to be at room temperature to achieve this. So after making sure that it is room temperature, also make sure that your glass or stainless steel bowl, which is the best ones to use, are very very clean and completely free from any traces of fat content. Plastic ones are not as nice because they do tend to retain some traces of fat content, which obviously will stop your meringue from forming. Now in a clean stainless steel or glass bowl, add the egg whites and beat on medium speed until it forms a soft peak. For the purpose of meringue, the soft peak stage is when the egg white just loses any trace of yellow and become white with very small transparent bubbles still visible. 
It should become fluffy without liquids on the side of your bowl and leave less than the amount of your fingertip on the beater when you pull them out. If you swirl a little with your beater and then pull it out and let some egg whites drop back onto the rest, it should gently sit on top like a small soft mound. Once the egg whites reach soft peak stage, start adding sugar one tablespoon at a time, beating at high speed for around 5 seconds between each addition. You do not have to be too specific about this, but do add them gradually. So I just gently add some by tipping the ball and adding them gradually. This should give sufficient time to let the sugar dissolve before you add more every time. Repeat this procedure until all sugar has been added. Then continue to beat until when the beater is lift up and you get a peak that holds its shape firmly. But the tips of the peak droop slightly. They should look moist and glossy as well. There should be a thick mound clustering inside the lower half of the beater too. If you are not at the stiff peak stage yet, continue to beat and stop to check. Once you reach the stiff peak stage, use your finger to take some of the egg whites and rub it between your fingers. If it feels gritty, it means the sugar granules are still there and you need to beat it a bit more until they are all dissolved. If it's smooth, it's ready to be used. Scrape down the sides of the bowl with a rubber spatula and the bottom and mix a few times just to incorporate any granules that may have been left in these areas. Now add the vanilla extract, the white vinegar and the corn flour and fold it in. To fold in, it's a simple action of using the rubber spatula and basically taking it, dragging it out from the center towards the outside in a swirling motion, then back in towards the center and back out again. Make sure you also go to the bottom and around the sides so that everything is incorporated properly. Sometimes pockets of flowers are left at the bottom. Folding action is to be gentle yet definite so that you do not waste your movements yet not being too vigorous so that you remove all the air that you have just incorporated into this batter. Now let's prepare the piping bag. First prepare a one centimeter plain piping tip, tip that is just round without patterns or something of a similar size and gently drop it head first into your piping bag, letting it slide through all the way to the end. Close the bag with your hand tightly and flick it downwards hard. The tip should be sitting snugly in place now. If not, you can push from the outside on the rear end of the tip to make it tighter. Fold outwards around quarter length of your piping bag and scoop the egg whites in. You can scrape a spatula along the inner folded edges to clean it off. Downfold the edges and twist till it feels tight and there are no air bubbles in there. This is how you can hold your piping bag. Taking a thumb and index finger of your dominant hand, loosely wrap it around the twist you made on the piping bag and then resting your palm under the piping bag. Now that you're in position, when you squeeze with this hand, depending on how much pressure you put, the batter that comes out will be of different thickness. When a batter is not so thick, you won't have to press too hard. If you are not confident, you can test on a plate or a piece of baking paper first to try to get a feel of how hard you want to press and even practicing the shapes. Now, the other hand should just rest palm up under towards the first part, the tip of the piping bag, just so it can position your piping bag. To pipe effectively, especially for straight lines, hold your hands and arms in position and use your body to move. If you pipe by moving your hands or arms, it will not be as stable. Now take the tray that you marked the strip guide on from before. Position the tray so that the shorter side faces you. This should make it easier for you to simply hold your hands and arms in one position with the piping bag and just shift your weight from one leg to another, letting your body guide your piping. Holding the piping bag so that the tip is at a 45 degrees angle from the surface of the baking paper. Starting from the furthest side away from you of the tray Pipe sticks of pavlova along the edge of the height sides of the guide, short side of the rectangular strip. Once you are close to reaching the marked length of the stick, stop squeezing the piping bag, gently dip the tip downwards on the paper and pull up and you should leave a very minimal droopy peak. Leaving a 5mm or so gap between each stick should be sufficient. Try to keep them the same length to have a tidy fence for your cake. Do the same for the second strip. If you have any more batter, just make more sticks until there is none left. Then gently dab your finger in some water and smooth the ends of each stick where you cut off from the piping bag so they look like smooth sticks. Don't make them too wet though or, you, or they won't bake properly. Just enough water to coat your fingers so you won't stick to them when trying to clean the shape up. 
Now send them off to bake for 35 to 40 minutes or until the outside is dry and a pale cream color. If it still looks a bit wet, give it a bit longer. Make sure to check always earlier, so maybe around 25 minutes or 30 minutes, just so that you know you are not over baking it. If it still looks a bit wet, give it a bit longer. It will feel slightly firm to touch when pressed gently. Once baked, turn off the oven and leave the door slightly ajar. If you don't have a door that actually stays open slightly like that, what you can do is do what I do, simply grab any little baking tray or muffin trays, something like that, that is safe for the heat, and just put it in between the door and the oven. Let it cool down completely in the oven, and as it cools, it might crack slightly to reveal the marshmallowy center, but that's okay because it's normal. Once the pavlova sticks have cooled, remove from the oven. Pavlovas can be fragile, so be mindful when removing them from the baking paper. They should come off easily. From personal experience though, pavlovas do come off the st From personal experience though, as you can see, pavlovas do come off very easily when they're baked properly. Place the sticks in a clean, dry and airtight container whilst you make the pavlova cake, or if you're going to make them another day. Store them in a cool, dry place and it should keep for a few days. For garnish, you can use some sauce, such as coolies such as the strawberry coolie that I have demonstrated in a video before, or any other flavors that you have made. Make sure they are thawed and refrigerated so that you can use them cold, or heated up so that you can serve them hot. Now let's start the pavlova cake. 